Okay, I think we can. I think we can officially start. People are still kind of moving around, but I think this is this is it. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, nice to see you in person. That's the first thing I wanted to tell you. After a long, long time uh, and almost the whole project, uh, we are meeting in person. I'm Ivana Versic. Uh, I'm from Coordinating Institutions from SESDA. Um, I hijacked uh, two minutes from, from Marike to, to say hello to you, uh, to say how proud I am um, of this project, of all of us getting together, of doing a great job over 40 months. This is the last month, formally last month. We, we still have some reporting to do. Uh, but we achieved so much. Um, I remember uh, our preparatory meeting in, um, in Amsterdam at Schiphol, um, and there was a big room, and everybody at that point who, who were sort of involved in, service, in social science and humanities was in that room, and I remember thinking and actually saying at that first meeting, I think we already did it because we are in the same room, all of us together, which is kind of an achievement for so social sciences and humanities. And now we are here again after, after three something years uh, with a lot behind us, with a lot of achievements. And with, um, I, I will say, I, I, I hope I'm not jumping ahead of myself, but with, um, with a success story uh, for the EC and, and for RIA, I hope. Um, so um, thanks again for coming. Very nice to see you. Let's have a great final conference. Let's show everybody and to ourselves uh, what we did um, again. I'm extremely proud to be part of this project. So thanks for coming. Uh, so thanks, Ivana, for that nice introduction. Um, as Ivana already said, welcome to the uh, SHOCK final conference, the advancing SSH research with shockingly good and sustainable resources. My name is Marie Willems from Trust IT, uh, lead from the work package on communication and dissemination. So it's very special that we're here today in Brussels and online. So in Brussels, we're going to meet with about 90 people in person, which is something very special. Uh, after two years of uh, a lot of online meetings, a lot of online events, as Ivana already said. Um, but it's also very special that we have about 150 people joining us online with us over the coming two days. Um, and I want to thank the whole organizing committee and the program committee for putting this in place and making it possible for so many people to join us and to see what we've done, as Ivana said, over the past 40 months. Let me see if I know how this works. Yes. Okay, so this is the first session of the whole conference. So this is uh, the welcome plenary, connecting the dots for SSH implementation in EOSC. A few housekeeping rules for the people online. Uh, they can, you can add your questions in the box that you find in the, in the platform. Um, and the people in the room, old fashioned, just to raise your hand and we'll give you a mic. The agenda of this session is a, a short welcome then the S3 point of view of connecting those dots, then uh, this is brought to us by Ivana, uh, then the EC and EOS point of view from Blago Vesta Cholova, our project officer from the EC, and then we're proud to also bring in a researcher point of view from Edward Gray, from Umanum, CNRS, and Daria. And then we have some time to address the questions that you may have added to the chat, which you've raised your hand for, and some questions that we also had uh, for our speakers. A quick overview, just to remind you where we, we started, what we did. Uh, we started off with 47 partners, um, but we on the long, along the road we onboarded SES, SSH Research Infrastructures. Um, it lasted for 40 months, this is our last month, so in three weeks we're gonna close the project, but it, does, it doesn't close our journey. Um, the project budget, over 14 million, we're a research and innovation action, and that's our website. The expected impacts, well, we set out to, um, to integrate uh, the social sciences and humanities seamlessly in the European Open Science Cloud. Um, we wanted to have uh, EU availability of high quality cloud ready SSH tools and high quality data. Uh, we wanted to maximize reuse through the open sciences and fair principles. Uh, we wanted to create an SSH open marketplace and this is the journey that we set out 40 months ago. Now today, you found all in your bag 
the Shog Legacy booklet. Uh, we're really proud to have this here. Uh, so from January 2019 to April 2022, uh, Shock transformed the social sciences and humanities landscape uh, with its disciplinary silos and separate facilities into an integrated and cloud-based network of interconnected data infrastructures. So read the booklet uh, because we were going to ask you about it uh, at 4.30 in our quiz, both for online and online, uh, offline and online attendees. Of course, you've seen a lot of our key exploitable results, those results that will remain available after the closing of the project. There are 33 in total. They cover data management, they cover data sharing and discovery, they cover training and support, they cover process and analysis, but most of all, they also cover the SSH communities that we created and that we, put, that we brought together. Then all tools are made uh, accessible through the SSH Open Marketplace, and some of them are also made available through the EOS, uh, EOSC portal so that they're even more accessible and available. So advancing SSH research with shockingly good and sustainable resources, that's the title of our conference. Um, the program is designed to showcase exactly those results and lever on the value that the synergies brought to us, but also tell us some of our user stories that we had along the road. And there will be also time to discuss policy issues and sustainability uh, and have a look towards the future. So now it's time to, uh, to talk to our uh, speakers today. So connecting the dots for SSH implementation in EOSC. Ivana, can I call you up on the stage for the first presentation? Okay, so S3, S3 point of view. Um, I was when I was thinking how to how to present this um, um, this very um, an ever growing um, complexity um, in in the landscape of research infrastructures, uh, which is I think mostly the the, the point of view of S3. Um, I was thinking where to start. Should, should I start from the beginning, where there were just a few research infrastructures, and then everything grew, or or go from 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 the backside, from more, more recent um, events, and and then I obviously opted for the letter. Um, because um, we were, you were a part of the journey, we were all together part of the journey, and I think we know enough about research infrastructures um, to, to know that it has been uh, very challenging um, for single infrastructure, and then when you put them together, and then you add the new ones, and then you add all other stakeholders, so obviously it gets complicated. But I think the important thing is that um, EC recognized that, uh, S3 recognized that, um, especially with the, but Blago will probably correct me uh, if needed, but especially with the clusters journey when, when they started in, in, in 2019. Um, I think it, over the years, it became um, sort of obvious that they are the new um, important players in the landscape, and this, this new combination of, of infrastructures is, is maybe one of the ways uh, forward. So that's why I decided to actually go, go from, from, from the backside and uh, uh, tell you about the, the workshop, which was a joint workshop um, by the EC and, and S3 on uh, 30th and 31st of March, um, where um, in the main specific breakout sessions we were actually discussing the needs uh, for research and innovation on behalf of the research infrastructures and actually how to move um, to the next funding period of Horizon Europe, and even more how to move beyond Horizon Europe and into the future, which is something that we actually couldn't imagine in the beginning of, of shock. We, we thought, I mean, that is it, and then we'll just go on as we used to. Uh, I don't think there is going back after shock, not the way uh, we, we, we used to anyways. Um, it's, it's kind of a new normal, like after COVID and after shock, which is not maybe the best comparison, but it's, you know, groundbreaking thing. So um, this is just an overview of what was, what was discussed at that, at that um, uh, conference workshop. Um, and um, it, it's kind of, it was acknowledged that there are, um, there is now broader landscape, more complex lands landscape with, with more actors, industry uh, or collaboration with industry gaining, uh, gaining momentum. Innovation is like the top priority. And of course, clusters, thematic cluster aspect it was 
like one, one of the, one of the uh, key aspects, transversal aspects of, of this discussion. Uh, and as I already said, how to, how to move after, after Horizon Europe. Um, so it was also paired, this workshop was sort of follow up on the high level launch of the, of the uh, S3 stakeholder forum. So you can see that there are like parallel events or events building on each other uh, by the EC, by S3, saying, okay, you are important, you have something to say. There is certain legacy that cannot be ignored. And that's why we want to follow this process and actually be in the process with you and see what you actually need from us, which I think is already a huge, a huge win. Um, this whole process uh, of consultations was, was highly based and is highly based on the, on the uh, latest S3 roadmap. And um, here you can see, and you will probably see this slide or combination uh, of it uh, throughout the conference, but there are the existing established uh, research infrastructures in SSH, you all know uh, the five. Um, no need to speak specifically about them, um, and they're part of the first tier, of course, and they've been landmarks since 2016, which meaning fully operational, fully established research infrastructures. In the very recent um, edition of, of S3 Roadmap, um, there are six new uh, projects, S3 projects featured on it, and it's, it's with great pleasure that five of them are actually part of shock, which means that we fulfilled one of our objectives, we fulfilled all of them by the way, but one of them in particular was connecting existing and, um, and emerging infrastructures and, and well, checked, Blago, that's done, <laughs> they are there. Uh, we will try to include the, 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 the remaining one as soon as possible. But the thing is that, that it existed, that they um, uh, recognized the need, so the emerging RIs recognized the needs to be uh, in the community with all other stakeholders, not only established research infrastructures. It's, it's a complicated ecosystem and everybody is equally important. We cannot function without each other. That's, that's obviously clear. Um, if, if it wasn't, it's clear now. So um, to, to learn from, 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 from the community and uh, from, from our side, let's say, the, the established infrastructure side, like SESDA, um, it is, it is very important uh, to be in touch, especially with thematic communities, with research communities, to, to sort of utilize their, their thematic specific expertise to, to offer um, more types of data, more thematic data uh, to the research community, which is the ultimate goal of, of any research infrastructure to serve the, the researchers community. So this is just a, a nice synergy, a symbiosis if, if you want, and it should exist and it, it, it cannot go, one cannot go without the other. So um, this is just to focus on, on research infrastructures. Of course, our ecosystem is, is much bigger, uh, but uh, just to show you the existing ones, the, the, the new ones, some of them were with us from the beginning uh, in the project like, like GGP or Wage Indicator of European Value Study. Uh, they've been around for quite a long time, and then the new ones, um, previously just you know informal networks now, uh, um, some of them even legal entities, uh, being on the roadmap and on their way to, to becoming uh, uh, an ERIC. And then if you zoom in from, from, from shock, uh, or even we can zoom into a single infrastructure um, like, like Clarin or Daria or any, any, any of, of, of landmarks, uh, there are very complex universes in themselves with service providers, with member states, with, with all the requirements that we have from, from EC and S3. And we put all of us together with all of other partners in shock. And then there is even a broader ecosystem with other cluster projects, and I'm happy to have representatives here in the audience with us, supporting us, and, and being part of these discussions because they're important. So shock is communicating to other cluster projects on a regular basis, which is another beautiful result of this project, that there is actually alignment across domains, which happened almost spontaneously, but it happened. So we align ourselves, we align ourselves with, with, with the broader system, with other clusters, with other domains, and we are all trying to connect um, our thematic parts uh, to the European Science Cloud. So it is complex. I mean, you look at it and you, you get dizzy. So, um, but this is the reality in which we, we are supposed to, to function. It's not, uh, it's not simple. It's challenging for, for all actors. It's challenging for us. It's challenging for the EC. It's challenging for S3 to manage it. That, that's why there are parallel processes, not only thinking about the new funding schemes and, and how to actually do it in the future, but it's also how to monitor 
whole bunch of research infrastructures that actually emerged, all important, but they, in a way, to fulfill their purpose, they, they also need to be evaluated, they need to be monitored. So, so there are many parallel processes. It's not to just we are all moving into one direction. It's, it, a lot is happening on, on the side uh, in, as I said, already a pretty packed uh, universe. And this is um, my last slide, but it's also the finalization or, or, or the start of the journey towards you know, the, the next, next funding periods or, or the future in general. Because in that same event, we went quite bold, quite ambitious. Um, at one point, there were talks about partnership agreements with the EC, um, the main roadmaps, so for the whole domain, doing it together, this community that is already sort of put together, that, that is an, an established community, um, have a strategic alignment within ourselves with other domains, um, move towards multi-annual funding, and I'm not talking about projects of three years, let's say seven or eight years, um, entry support for new, um, for new communities, for new infrastructures, aspiring infrastructures, which would, of course, lead to, to more uh, stability, uh, sustainability, and ultimately, I, I really do believe that better support to researchers. So, so things are changing, and very um, well. A few years ago, I would say very un unpredictable and not even imaginable ways. But I think we are actually at the start of unimaginable, and um, I'm very happy that that shock is part of that. So, I finish with this and uh, give it to Marika. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Vanna. So our next speaker is Blago Vesta Cholova. Uh, she has a background, academic background in social sciences uh, and was an active user of some of the databases uh, in, the, in the project during her PhD and postdoctoral work. Uh, and after joining the European Commission, Ms. Cholova has occupied several positions as policy and project officer, officer uh, and was actively involved in evidence gathering for science-based policy um, and social sciences input to policy. <clears throat> so after joining the, so the research agent, uh, executive agency, Ms. Cholova is now responsible for the overall SSA's portfolio of European projects. Um, so thank you for joining us today. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to begin by saying that I'm very happy to be here. It's my first conference since the beginning of the pandemic where I'm actually in person <laughs> seeing an audience. It's a huge uh, change, so thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here, and I'm also very happy, particularly happy of uh, um, being invited in the final conference of this project. As uh, Marike said, it's close to my heart because I've been using some of these infrastructures already as a researcher some 10, 15 years ago. And um, I'm very happy that uh, we have achieved what we have achieved um, so far. So that is uh, great. Um, I don't know how that works. Where do I need to? Because there are several buttons here. This one. All right. So shocking its beginnings, I wanted to start a little bit with an overview of um, yeah, the main idea behind the project and also the whole cluster of projects because uh, this project is part of, um, as um, Ivana just said, a cluster of five uh, projects uh, that were supposed to integrate different scientific domains into the European Open Science Cloud. And the idea was really to somehow try to group different disciplines into a cluster, having different infrastructures working together to have, a, let's say, a coherent um, organization of the whole domain and integrate it in the Open Science Cloud with all the specificities of each uh, scientific domain. And uh, of course, uh, the idea was also to ensure that um, there is a connection between the infrastructures that were already identified by the ESPRI and uh, their integration to the EOSC, which was the European Open Science Cloud, which is an uh, ongoing uh, process. It will still continue in the future, but uh, this was the main, one of the main goals of this uh, project and of this call. And um, also the idea was, of course, that uh, within these clusters, there are common standards, there are common, um, let's say, uh, ontologies and uh, interoperability between different databases, 
and you're well placed in shock to know how difficult that can be, especially in uh, human and social sciences where you can, uh, I mean, you have a lot of different disciplines that are not really used to working together. And this was one of the huge challenges that shock needed to, uh, to face in the beginning, uh, I think. Also, of course, the idea was to develop synergies between all the infrastructures that are involved uh, in the um, ecosystem to, uh, to, to develop really fair and open data um, and integrated in the uh, open science cloud so that it can be accessible for researchers everywhere in Europe and beyond. And uh, they can easily jump from one, uh, let's say, sub-discipline to another to uh, have uh, this interdisciplinary research, which is uh, today a must, I would say, in most disciplines in Europe. So the idea was really to put all these communities together and create a, hom a homogeneous, I would say, um, cluster uh, for human and social sciences. And of course, this would have required to adopt common approaches in data management, um, data management lifecycle, standardization of data, and this is one of the, the huge achievements, I think, in this, in this project. Because, as I will say, uh, I mean, again, one of the most important things is that there are many, many different types of disciplines, type, different types of databases. It's not as simple to put them all together and make it work. So what are the achievements and the challenges? Um, uh, some have already been mentioned. I think one uh, of the main challenges and achievements was that there was a crucial momentum for interdisciplinary research during the COVID-19 pandemic. All the scientific communities were called to work together in order to find solutions, uh, not only to fight the pandemic um, in the, the field of life sciences, but also social sciences uh, and humanities. They needed to contribute to these health policies and understanding the, the pandemic. So I think it was a crucial momentum that pushed interdisciplinary research beyond what we have had um, so far. And uh, this was also uh, a challenge, of course, for all research communities because they had to work remotely, they had to work separately, but this was a huge push also for using these remote databases, this uh, digital access, and this was a, a very important moment for uh, communities like, like Shock to also develop further and uh, improve their, their access and work in really remote, uh, remote conditions. And for some communities, this was quite a challenge. Um, now, the achievements, of course, <laughs> one of the biggest ones, and I mentioned it already, is to build this community, uh, really, to gather together different disciplines. One can hardly imagine how one can put together a museum collection with literary studies, with uh, historical archives, social science data, and make it all work. So this is really one of the greatest achievements of, uh, of shock. All these um, uh, infrastructures existed in the past, as Ivana was saying, but they were not really as interconnected uh, as they are, they are today. And this is a huge, a huge achievement. It was, I imagine, a huge challenge as well, and uh, we still have some work to do, but it's already what has been achieved is amazing. And um, creating, of course, a one-stop shop for researchers in different disciplines with interoperable data and persuade the, the, the researchers to go beyond their field and use data from different sources. Here, I, I, uh, I like to give this example because to me it was very telling. Uh, some time ago, I read in a history review a research that was done on the fall of the Roman Empire. And the researchers, they uh, have um, come up with data from um, environmental sciences to prove that actually there was a point of a huge drop during the, the, the end of the, the, when the period of the fall of the Roman Empire that provoked uh, probably lack of uh, scarce resources and famine in some places that precipitated the end of the fall of Rem uh, Roman Empire. But this was a, an example of how historical science hand in hand with environmental sciences can come up with a new, let's say, um, interpretation of history. And this is something great, and this is, I think, the way research will be done in the future. COVID is another example of how different disciplines came hand in hand to work together. So having interoperable data, but also having research communities 
of researchers that go beyond their field and they try to combine different types of data from different disciplines. This is the future of science, at least the way, the way, the way we see it. So it's very important to have these platforms, to have these databases available, accessible for all researchers. Um, and fair and open database, of course, uh, is um, uh, one, uh, one huge step uh, forward. Um, now, uh, of course, where do we go from here? There, are still, um, there is still work to do, and we are very much aware of this. Um, we, we will not end with the end of this project, uh, end of this month. Um, for the European Open Science Cloud, at least uh, the next steps will be to consolidate the existing databases and also integrating new ones, as was also shown by Ivana. So this process will continue, the databases work, will continue to grow, other uh, research infrastructures may join these uh, already existing communities, but they will join already, um, let's say, in a better condition with the ground already prepared for metadata, for interoperability, for standardization. They will not have to go through all this process um, again. It will be there for them to, to adapt and to just integrate their, their database. Also sharing the know-how and the best practices between scientific domains. I think it's very important between the five clusters that were just shown, not only science, social sciences, humanities, but also the life sciences, uh, material science. There are five clusters in total uh, in the, the EOSC that were shown by Ivana. And I think it's very important that those continue to work together because the idea is at one point to have a coherent database that could really be used without um, any uh, yeah, problem from, from one discipline to another, really interconnected. It's, it, it's, the, the process is ongoing, it's very difficult, we are very much aware of this, but uh, it will still need to go further, a step further to, con to integrate, let's say, these different clusters into the open, open science cloud. Now, um, another thing is, uh, of course, to increase uh, the awareness among researchers and uh, the users of those uh, databases. Some researchers might still tend to use their database as they were used to and not to look beyond that. So we really need to make an effort to, to, to promote what has been achieved here and to promote this access that we offer to, to other uh, databases and to uh, yeah, this huge community in the European Open Science Cloud. So this is also still to come. Um, another thing is, of course, to strengthen the links uh, between the EOSC Association and the clusters. Uh, this process will continue in the future. Uh, there are links already established, of course, but it will need much more integration, much more coordination, I would say, in order to make it really work at the level of EOSC, because this is only a small part of what is in the cloud, and um, we li really need to, make, to organize the data and make it work also at, uh, in terms of governance and uh, include all the actors there. And the sustainability of databases, I wanted to underline this point because we all know that a database that is not updated uh, become, becomes obsolete, apart from historical studies, of course. But uh, for all the rest, <laughs> yeah, they are lucky in that sense, but uh, for all the rest, we need to keep updating these databases because if we don't, if we don't use them, if we don't sustain these updates, they, they become obsolete and they will not be used um, in the future. So this is one of the challenges. Um, what Horizon Europe brings to us in, uh, in that sense, um, some of you might be aware uh, now there is a different structures of the um, European infrastructure calls in the new Horizon Europe program. Um, so the communities will not be funded by discipline as it used to be in the past. There are a variety of calls, different ones. The uh, European Open Science Cloud related ones are part of the new program and there are specific calls for the, the development of the European Open Science Cloud for interoperability of data, for um, improving some of the standards and so on. There will be specific dedicated calls for this in the future, but also um, the, the, the calls that are more, what we call the tech calls that uh, are concentrated on developing new tools, new methods that can also be used for um, developing, let's say, 
new ways to uh, improve the database with, um, let's say, a web panel, with digital tools, etc. So those calls can also contribute to the development of this, uh, this community and these databases further. And of course, um, the calls that are um, dedicated to the development of uh, existing and new, integrating new communities, internationalization of uh, the databases that we have, and uh, partnerships with uh, S3 and uh, beyond other uh, communities. But also the so-called surf calls, sorry for the <laughs> language of uh, we, we, we hardly, I mean, uh, get rid of it in the commission. Sorry about this. The surf calls that are um, some, some part, I mean, they are uh, mostly concentra concentrated on offering access to existing databases, uh, but um, they will be uh, also challenge driven, meaning that we will fund offering access to specific databases that um, somehow address the main challenges of today and uh, the future, uh, pandemics, uh, environment, but um, yeah, digital transition, uh, etc. But also curiosity driven service, service access to, and here is uh, where humanities uh, come uh, very often, uh, calls uh, that are uh, really um, funding access to historical archives, museums, and um, other smaller communities to, uh, to, to offer access to, to researchers. So um, the idea is in Horizon Europe and beyond uh, to have bigger communities um, with one or several domains working together to address a specific challenge, and I already talked about this but also to focus open access and uh, the three uh, uh, types of impact that we uh, want to have, so economic, environmental, social, um, which is important for the social sciences and humanities, and I think uh, your disciplines can really uh, make, make the difference there because you have the understanding of how society works, of uh, the, the, the culture, of uh, the history, and this is very, very important if we want to make the right decisions for the future. It's not only about technology, it's about society. And um, of course, what we would expect in the future is also links with other similar projects that are in different, uh, funded by different programs, not within the research infrastructures program, like uh, Europeana that is looking into museum collections and making them uh, uh, open, but it's not uh, uh, focused on researchers. So those links need to be further strengthened and, um, and addressed um, beyond. Now, I wanted to conclude with some words, uh, and the slide is uh, uh, titled, what do you, you need? Because this is what we want to hear from you, actually, within this, this conference, and uh, we have organized also other events. We want to build on, on the achievements so far and uh, to keep the, the databases updated and accessible, but we also want to increase uh, these databases with new communities and, of course, the users. Um, and we want to improve still further the cooperation with, with, with other scientific domains, as I just mentioned, and improve uh, visibility and impact, which is also a point a bit weaker maybe in social sciences and humanities still. Um, some communities are much more active in showing their impact uh, on policy, on society. So I think an effort there uh, for promoting really, for um, making uh, yeah, policy makers, but also society as a whole, understand the importance of these sciences needs, uh, needs to be done. So these are the priorities for us and you would be the ones really to tell us how to achieve this and uh, what do you need as specific, um, let's say, uh, challenges that need to be addressed in the next programs so that we make uh, this uh, shock success sustainable in the future and we build on this um, success to, to make it uh, grow and uh, develop uh, even further. So I end up with to be continued because I really want to hear from you uh, in the panels uh, also, and I'll be participating in some of those. What are the needs? Because we are not funding um, the Open Science Cloud or in general uh, these grants uh, just because we have policy priorities. We want to make uh, the researcher community, um, we want to improve the conditions of this research community to, to work and to um, make not only excellent science, but to contribute to the general challenges. So the needs are really uh, what, we, uh, what we want to address first, uh, first and foremost. That's, um, that's the end of my uh, presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And um, yeah, 
Thank you again for being here. Thank you very much, Blago Vesta. Uh, so, what do you need? Uh, the next speaker is uh, Edward Gray. He comes with a, a double vision. He comes with a researcher hat on and uh, somebody who is already very much involved in shock, uh, going to tell us about researcher point of view. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, in the wrong direction. Very good. Um, so I'm here to give the researcher's point of view. And what I really have to say is that if we think about our end user, think of the typical researcher and be generous, they're not going to have understood a lot of the things we just talked about. It impacts them. It's very impactful for them. What we do is truly quite important. But the alphabet soup of shock Esfri, Daria, Eric, they have no idea. They want something that works. Most, we're here as infrastructure people. We live for this. We love work packages. We dream about annual reports. But most of our researchers, our end users, they're trying to teach, to commit some research. They have committee work. They're participating in a conference. They have to get this article copy in. They're trying to have a family and a social life. And then maybe they'll get to research. So they appreciate what we do but they only have a limited amount of time and sort of mental availability to get through, to, to get all of this work done. And this is where we come in. We are there as facilitators. This is what we can do in our position as infrastructure people. So I wanted to talk about this a little bit because I have a particular history. I was a historian. I call myself a recovering historian. And for me, I became this, this infrastructure person almost by accident, but it's something I've fallen into and, and love quite a bit. But I, I maintain contacts with my colleagues in the history field. And I'm always answering this so what question. I'm always, only, I'm always answering what infrastructure actually is, what Daria is, what shock is. And, and I try to bring this so what question to them. And I, I really like to rely on Adam Krimble's book that came out just as the pandemic was starting, Digital Technology and the Historian. And it makes a great point. All historians, all researchers, we're affected, change, we're affected by the changes brought about by digital technology. Think about it today. There are 80 or so of us in the room, but there's another 150 watching from across the world. The way that we teach and do research, the way we do academia is fundamentally digital nowadays, and you can't escape from it. And even the most retrograde old emeritus professor has to use his email at the end of the day. So the digital is really just another tool in your toolbox. It's another way of reaching historical truth to the extent that we can say we reach historical truth. And that's why I think it's important to talk about one of the big SSH um, open marketplace. It's, it's one of the big key exploded results from the Shock Project. In the marketplace, it isn't just for digital humanists. This is not just for those that do digital because it's for all humanity scholars. We, when we conceived this in Work Package 7, made sure that it was available for everyone from the most confirmed digital humanist to the person that's just beginning and has no idea and really no interest in becoming digital. So I thought of a few use cases here to really show why this is important. One is focused on geographic information system and the other, near and dear to my heart, is on handwritten text recognition. And I also want to put a particular emphasis on training materials and workflows because what I really like about digital humanities, it's deeply collaborative. This is a way where we can get literature folks, historians, language specialists, and we, we're using the same tools. We're not producing the same types of research, but we use the same tools. We have the same epistemological questions, and it's really interesting to have this mix, this fundamental interdisciplinarity that makes things come together. So let's think about this use case. So we, we have Nathan. He's studying princely voyages in the Holy Roman Empire. Again, I'm a historian. Um, and he wants to represent this data and see what patterns of movement come alive. When you have confessionalization between Catholics and Protestants, do Catholic princes avoid Protestant territories? Do they go nonetheless? What, what defines this way of movement? Well, he has the data, but how is he going to visualize it? How is he going to show this in his research? Well, he hears from a friend about the SSH Open Marketplace. And he says, well, I can find this. And he not only finds the tools, and it can be things such as story map JS, map warfare Palladio, and so on and so forth, but he also finds lessons. He finds the training materials from the program historian that are necessary to allow him to undertake this analysis. And this is what's interesting, is you have, this is a, a screenshot from the open marketplace, is you have this training material that explains step by step 
how to go through this process. Because again, as a researcher, we don't have time, but they can go here and find out exactly how to do what they're trying to do. And here again, he finds out, okay, I, I wanna look for the tool, QGIS, someone told me it's a good thing. He can look it up, he finds the link to the tool, but he also finds, and that's the one in blue and on top, but he also finds in orange all the different training materials that can explain to you how to use QGIS. So you don't have to, to sit there and read the documentation. You can find exactly the use case you want to do. It also recommends another related tool, GrassGIS, that maybe is more adapted or maybe not, but he can make that decision. Nathan can decide what is the best thing for him to move his research forward. And what I really like this is this is the sort of serendipitous discovery that takes us back to the good old days of going into the library. When we wanted to learn more about the Thirty Years' War and the horrors, we can go and look up the book by Ronald Ash, but we find next to it, in the library, a book by Peter Wilson, and we can pull that out. And we didn't know we wanted it, but we found it. It's right next to it. So we recreate the same serendipitous discovery that we had back in the good old days, and, and, and we continue to move forward with it. And I want to talk about another use case here, handwritten text recognition. Who has time to read this? I mean, I, I've read this, I've transcribed it, it took me many hours. Um, it's a really interesting document. Um, but really, when you're a researcher and don't have time, and we have technology that allows us to move forward, why not let the machine work for you? And this is one of the things that is really interesting is because in the marketplace we have training but also workflows. Workflows are real research use cases. So this is how to extract textual content from images. This is OCR. And, and I think when you have this step-by-step -step explanation of how to move forward, and in each step, as we'll see, they are showing the ways that you can use different tools and data sets and publications and training materials, it becomes a really powerful tool. So again, we see a, a link from the open marketplace. We see that you have the, the way to go to the workflow and find out how it works, and we can open it up. And each step that you open up, from defining characteristics, define the image, uh, survey the existing experiences, choose the engine that's most specific. Every time you can open it and expand and then find all of the related tools, services, training materials, publications and data sets that can be relevant to this real research use case. So it's really a way for you to take something that you're using yourself to explain the way you come across it and to have other researchers come in and figure out what is the best adapted for their use cases. Because this is what I want to finish with is this idea that we're here as infrastructure people, but enabling research and researchers is research in and of itself. We are no less legitimate than the, the most retrograde old professor that doesn't want to do any infrastructure thing and does not understand what EOSC is or ESFRI or DARIA and Claren. So again, they don't understand shock. What is an ERIC? What says the Darren, Claria, Claria even? But we're toasters. Everyone in this room is a toaster. We are the unsung but vital part of making research or toast happen. The tools produced in the EOS context facilitate and empower researchers in making the journey from point A to point B that much easier. You don't think about the toaster. You take the bread, you put it in the toaster, you push the button, you walk away, and it comes out 30 seconds later perfectly done. In the same way is they don't see the work that goes into developing the SSH Open Marketplace. They don't see the work that we do in the infrastructures in SESTA and Claren and Daria. But they know that they can go to this website, they click the button, and they find what they need to get to. And this is what we do. Where it's unsung, but it's important work. And we're there and they appreciate it. And I can tell you, when I explain to my colleagues that, that are not involved in infra, that they have this tool available, they think it's fantastic. And they ask me, sometimes many times and again to explain it, but they see the value in it and they can get to it. So what we do is valuable. They may not capture the cost actions and, and the ERICs and the ESFRIs and the roadmaps, but they understand what we do and it is important for them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Edward. Can I call Blago, Ivana, and Edward on the stage to see if we have any questions and otherwise we move to these ones. Anna, do we have questions from the audience online and do you in the room have questions for our speakers? Any questions about the researcher point of view, about the S3 point of view, or the EC point of view that you just heard? We do have a question from the online audience okay. for Edward. Um, so it was a great metaphor with library. In the SSH open marketplace, who or what is the reference librarian? 
All right, it's on. That is a really great question. The reference librarian, in a way, um, I, I think there's two ways of thinking of it. On one hand, we can say that the, the engine, the marketplace itself, the data model that puts together the different keywords, that links together the different things, you, you have this serendipitous sort of way where it figures itself out. It's sort of in the way of, as the librarian organizes their library, that, that's sort of fundamentally there. But then the reference librarian, the person itself, that can become the community that's behind it. Because one of the key points of the SSH Open Marketplace is, is that we have this editorial board that comes in that is filled with various domain experts that are there and then can explain in, in, in personal detail how it works. So I think you have sort of, to carry this library metaphor, you have the, the structural organization that corresponds to the classification of the library, as well as you have the editorial board that can be there to answer questions and continues to curate because that's another one of the big points of the editorial board in the SSH Open Marketplace, is that we curate the material that's inside and we make sure that it is up to date, because as we all know, digital humanities is a rapidly changing field. Code changes, code becomes out of date, and we make sure that when people click the link, it should work. Thank you, Edward. That is also very much related to what Blago already mentioned earlier, everything needs to stay updated. Do you want to comment on that, Blago? Well, no, in, in the end, it's true that, I mean, this is one of the most important things because we've seen in the past, and this is from past experience in research projects, that we have been funding some projects that uh, collected data and this data at one point just stayed on a website for some time and then disappeared. And uh, all the effort that was put in there was lost for the research community. What, we don't want this to happen anymore. And this is one of the reasons why we thought of European Open Science Cloud, because it's a place where data is kept and updated and can be reused by other researchers in 10 years from now that can come back to this data but also use new one. And uh, so this is very important also to point out that we've learned from the past that data can easily be lost and we don't want this to happen anymore, not with public money at least. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, Is this on? Yeah, yeah. hello. Uh, yeah, first of all, thank you for the really interesting presentations and for the amazing work being done. Um, my question is that I think we all know as, as scientists that the existence of tools isn't nearly as important as the understanding of how to use them. I think we, we all know uh, the master students who are only just discovering uh, JSTOR and uh, EndNote and, and other associated tools. So my question would be, uh, what has shock done, what can shock do, what is being done in order to increase awareness and literacy about the use of those tools, perhaps even before the academic career begins, uh, during uh, the education, bachelor's, master's, etc.? So I'm, I'm going to start and then Edward will, will continue because Edward is the researcher guy. <laughs> so um, you know that um, Shock uh, had a, a very extensive collaboration between two packages, Work Package 2, which is dissemination, outreach, exploitation, and, and Work Package 6, which is actually uh, empowering community, and basically that's training. Um, and I know that there are some thousands of, of people reached in the trainings, um, 100 plus events happened, and that's within the project duration. And now we go to the part what Blago just said, when project is done, everything sort of dies. So how do we move from there? Uh, from the shock point of view, I can tell you that we are working actually very hard to continue with this community, with collaborations, and, and you are all aware uh, that there is an MOU that is already in place being signed, and um, this will actually be sort of the launch for the broader communi community to join. But even though it's not legally binding, it is, it is a connection, and actually a pretty powerful one if taken seriously, and I, and I think that we all want all of this to continue. As I said, there is no going back after shock. Uh, at least I don't see it. Uh, so uh, there is a challenge in telling researchers, uh, telling the community that we exist for how to actually use everything that we have produced, how to help us to advance what is still not finished or need, need polishing, because we also have that kind of stuff. We, we didn't manage to do everything perfectly, of course, we would like to say, but it, it is the majority and there is always work to be done. And what Blago said on a more sort of abstract level, 
there, there is work to be continued, uh, especially on interoper interoperability and, and users, as, as you heard. So there were quite a lot of work done in shock uh, on, on spreading the word uh, about the tools and services and everything that we have. Uh, uh, there is a firm plan how to continue collaboration. Um, there will be new funding, there will be new calls, new projects where we could then within this umbrella um, agreement of the MOU, think how to combine you know, different, different partners into new, new, uh, new projects and continue. Uh, and of course, there is the exploitation plan and there are plans for, for majority of tools and services how to actually continue uh, by being sustained uh, by partners. So um, it is a bit broader than, than you asked, uh, but this is what SHOC has been doing and is planning to do as, as a community to, to continue. And um, now I'll give it to Edward to, for, for, for the exact, you know, pin, pinpointed researcher perspective. So yeah, I think it's, it, it's, it's a really great question, this question of sustainability and, and also training and how do we continue to make sure that we reach out to these communities. And I know on one hand, we worked very hard to make sure that the training resources that were produced by our colleagues in Work Package 6 in collaboration with all the other members of the project are sustainable. They have been placed into the SSH Open Marketplace. Um, we were working on that the, just this past week, and I, so I know I've seen it. I've done it. Um, so that's already in there. But it's also this question of you have this... I, I want to say almost like physical infrastructure aspect of yes, it's in the marketplace. This stuff is being kept along. We, you know, we've uploaded presentations through various like you know things are on Zenodo, so they're always going to be there, theoretically. Um, but it's also the question of knowledge. I mean, this is something that I know that we've done with the CNRS. Is Nicola and I? We've gone forward and had meetings with folks in national conferences where we've explained what we're doing and the things that we've learned. And then afterwards, we get solicited for our knowledge on, you know, this is for the, the data citation we're working on. So this continues, you, you create sort of the human infrastructure that has the knowledge through these projects, that spreads the knowledge to others who can then spread that knowledge. It's almost like a contagion, um, since we've all learned over the past few years how, how disease works. Um, but you also have the, this aspect of it is physically put into, well, digitally put into the marketplace uh, where it can still be accessed. Thanks. Are there any other, I see a question there. Thank you very much. So my question is more for the, for the European Commission. Uh, so s some dirty minds say that the cloud doesn't exist, it's just someone else's computer. Uh, so <laughs> with, with that being in mind, uh, and I appreciate what you said that uh, we need to be sure that data is available in 10 years. But what I would say that in, in the SSH area, this is more in terms of centuries that we may have to reuse data. So, and, and, and so far, uh, we have been unable to, to set up a good plan. So, and I think it would be very important to, to start thinking how we can sustain on the very long term all the data we have, especially because it's, it's pretty easy to, uh, to keep data when they are hot because you can always find company also that, that can build a business model to maintain this data. But after some period of time when, when the data get colder and colder, it's much harder to sustain them. And, and this is where I think the European Commission and the member state have to step in to ensure that this data will remain available for centuries, no matter how many people are looking into it, because one day maybe they will become crucial and, and vital for us. So do you think that there, there, there would be some possibility to to start or, or kick that discussion and, and, and start working on a more longer term plan. Thank you. Thank you very much for this question. Well, uh, the simple answer is yes. This is the idea. <laughs> the idea for the European Open Science Cloud and all this uh, funding and efforts that went into there is not that it will disappear in five years. Uh, now, that being said, we all know that technology changes very fast. We don't know if the cloud will be the technology of the future or there will be something even more advanced, um, metaverse, I don't know, whatever, that would even uh, yeah, allow researchers to go into the Middle Ages and uh, look by themselves uh, how it would look like, really, in a parallel universe. Um, we don't know, but we're trying to not only follow the, the, the really the technology, the, the, the best technology that exists, but we are dedicated to, 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 to fund and sustain as far as we can these databases uh, in the yeah, for foreseeable future. And I can tell you that the efforts since the European Open Science Cloud kicked off was, were to integrate all possible databases in there so that at one point 
each researcher in Europe could just go to the cloud and find the data they need, uh, ideally without any uh, yeah, need for fees or whatever. So uh, free of charge. And this is the, the, the philosophy of the open, open science cloud. So I, I don't see it dying in five years, so on the contrary. But what the risk is, of course, is that if we don't make sure that it works, it could fall into oblivion because researchers could find that it's too difficult to use, not really up to the standard, not updated. I mean, those, uh, let's say, little challenges as we go need to be addressed every year, every month. <laughs> and we need to make sure that the database works because what kills databases is also when they, when they, they don't work or they become obsolete. Then the researchers just don't use them. It can, it can stay there for thousands of years, but nobody uses it anyway. So. So that's, uh, so that's the idea of uh, the, the open science cloud. And um, another idea which I uh, always underline is that uh, behind the open science itself is that um, as long as this is public money, we do not uh, allow the researchers to pay extra fee to access them because it has already been paid for. This research has been paid for already by the taxpayers themselves. So that's why being open is very important. And this is an effort that will be sustained in the future too, to open research um, databases and uh, yeah, infrastructures to everybody. So, so these are things I think uh, they will be, of course, uh, still uh, efforts in the future and calls for funding. Member states have their role to play, indeed, because it's not that easy, I can tell you, especially in some areas like cultural heritage, to really persuade the member states to share the data. But um, but we are we are getting there, and this is I believe that this is uh, yeah this is the future. So I don't see it dying in five years. No, no, not at all. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. With this, uh, we need to close this session. But I do want to ask each of our speakers to have one line as a last recommendation or a last thought uh, that you want to close this session off with a takeaway. One sentence. A sentence. Um, Spread the word about shock results within your own communities. That's the way, one of the ways to keep them alive. Yeah. <laughs> what can I say more? Um, I would like to bridge a bit into the discussions to come and uh, again uh, maybe say um, think of from your own perspectives and for the panels that come what, what we need to do more to make it work for the future, for now for all of you. Thanks. And I think the, the one thing I would like to, to have as a takeaway is we have to meet the researchers where they are. We have to understand who they are, what they're doing, what their needs are, and we need to communicate to them in this way and move sort of away from the, the Euro blah blah and, and move towards how we can impactfully reach the researchers where they are and speak to them in their own language. Thank you. Now, before we give our speakers a, a, a very loud applause, I would like to uh, give a few practical pointers. After this session, uh, there is the coffee break. For those of you that have been invited to the policy uh, discussion, you need to go to mo uh, room Huygens, which is on the first floor, different than you had in, the, in your email, uh, where you will be welcomed by Ivana. Um, and then, uh, you know that we've been online for almost two years, or more than two years, uh, so we don't have a group picture. We had a lot of online pictures. Uh, we had a, lot, uh, a picture in 2019, but we do need you to take out your cap at 5.30 uh, in the Einstein room here uh, for a group picture, okay? So don't forget to bring that. And so I want to give our speakers a very loud applause. Thank you for kicking off this conference.